All right, Marcello Ienka, welcome to the Nuke Life podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. Why do you think that we need human rights now that we're having all of these new newer technologies being developed? Um, I would probably say for a twofold reason. Um, the first reason is uh, because of the importance of the human brain. Um, you know, the human brain is uh, arguably the most important organ uh, of the human body. It uh, governs not only life maintaining functions such as respiration, circulation, uh, but also all those uh, so called uh, mental faculties, so cognition, perception, emotions, and it's the main side of uh, behavioral control. So, all those things that uh, make us human and uh, um, underlie our um, uh, personal identity agency and all those uh, fundamental ethical legal notions that um, that are very uh, at core of our societal um, systems and values um, so this is probably the the simplest answer uh, but there is also an historical and pragmatic reason for that i would say um, namely that um, human rights uh, were notably um, developed um, before the uh, technological innovation led uh, to systems that have the capacity to directly interface the human brain. Um, and therefore, they do not spell out specific requirements on how uh, the human uh, brain should or should not be uh, accessed, altered, and, uh, um, and uh, simulated. Um, using uh, advanced uh, neurotechnologies, especially in combination with artificial intelligence. So I would say there is, there is a twofold reason. And then probably I would add also a third reason, namely that um, uh, human, the human brain, uh, human brain tissue and human brain data are um, inherent to all human beings, uh, regardless of their uh, nationality, uh, background culture, uh, sex, um, and so on. Um, and therefore, they are very uh, suitable um, entities for protection at the level of uh, fundamental human rights. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, in your work of suggesting new human rights, right. what can you give us an overview of what are the human rights that you are suggesting get added to the currently existing human rights? Well, we, we suggested four um, new human rights uh, that are specific to the neurocognitive domain, which we call neuro rights. Um, and these are the right to cognitive liberty, the right to mental privacy, the right to mental integrity, and the right to psychological continuity. But I, um, I would like to clarify that while we um, made this proposal, we uh, mentioned these four new human rights as potential candidates um, mm. to become new human rights. It's right. not a postulation, but it's really um, a, a proposal, a suggestion. Um, there is a lot of debate among legal scholars about the so-called rights proliferation, which is the risk that if we turn into rights, anything, any moral desiderata, so anything that is morally desirable, there is a, a risk of uh, a diminishing or even degrading the importance that value, uh, that rights have in our society and our legal systems. So um, I'm personally fairly agnostic about this four new rights should be considered as brand new rights or rather as specifications or um, you know, uh, specific instances or uh, requirements that we spell out, um, uh, and also as potentially evolutionary interpretations of existing rights. So one yeah. obvious um, example is the right to mental privacy, which is um, an extension or specification of the general right to privacy. Um, would, you, would you like me to spell out these four new rights in two details? Yeah, please start with cognitive, cognitive liberty. Yeah. Yeah, so cognitive liberty uh, can be sort of uh, 
introduced as a prerequisite of all other neuro-specific rights uh, because it protects the right of individuals to make free and competent decisions about the use of neurotechnology. So it's both a positive and a negative right. Uh, on the positive side, um, it, um, um, it ensures and protects the right and ability of people to make free use of neurotechnology if they wish to do so for purposes such as uh, um, uh, brain monitoring or even cognitive enhancement. Um, so it protects the right of people to enhance their cognitive abilities here using neurotechnology. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's a negative right uh, that prevents uh, uh, unauth unauthorized, unconsented access to a person um, neural computation or unconsented and um, alterations or modification of the neural computation by third parties. Mm. So for example, uh, in, in the positive sense, the right to cognitive liberty allow uh, people who want to try uh, transcranial direct current stimulation uh, for uh, enhancement purposes to, to do so. Uh, but it also prevents um, um, employers, for example, uh, from requiring compelled uh, neuromodulation or access to, for example, elect electroencephalography data um, of their um, employees. Right. Um, so it has this uh, twofold uh, value. Would this human right then entail that all substances, all drugs become legal in every country of the world? Because the human right is like in every country of the world which agreed to the human rights, of course. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, my focus is primarily on neurotechnology, uh, not much on, on neuropharmacology. Uh, but um, I must say, I haven't thought extensively on this issue, but I would, uh, in general terms, I would say yes. Uh, one implication of the right to cognitive liberty as applied to pharmacology uh, would would be the legalization of drugs, mm. uh, you know, provided that uh, this does not conflict with other rights. Um, right. So, for example, uh, you know, again, unauthorized use of uh, uh, of uh, drugs by uh, third parties that would be prevented. Right. But that people might have a, a general a right to modulate. Uh, their um, their uh, their neural activity. Um, this uh, might also be applicable to pharmacology as well. Mm. And that negative right that you have the right to not be manipulated neurochemically by unauthorized parties that very much ties into the other proposed human rights of mental privacy. Yeah. Would you describe it in a bit more detail for us? Yeah, absolutely. So mental privacy is basically, uh, as I said before, as the application, the extension of privacy, privacy rights to the cognitive domain. So it's uh, designed to uh, protect uh, brain information from uh, unconsented access uh, by, by third parties. Um, now, this is a, an instance of, of a general privacy rights, uh, but what is uh, questionable, uh, what is not clear yet, is what is the, um, the position, what is the location of uh, um, brain data in the current data protection landscape. So if we consider um, brain data as uh, general personal data or uh, personal identifiable information as it's called in the United States, uh, then uh, it would fall under the protections, for example, of the general data protection regulation in, in Europe. Uh, but uh, um, there is still uncertainty about where uh, brain data uh, should be located in the current data protection uh, uh, landscape. And this is something that uh, my colleagues and I and uh, some um, other researchers uh, globally are trying to figure out at the moment. 
And there is also um, one, one second argument. So besides this uh, sort of taxonomic uncertainty, there is a, a second argument in favor of uh, uh, specification of the requirements for privacy in the mental and cognitive domain. And this is the, the fact that brain activity uh, can be potentially recorded uh, from an individual uh, without their direct awareness uh, and without their direct um, uh, comprehension of the kind of information that is being collected from them. So for example, if I am using, for example, uh, consumer electroencephalography PCI uh, for, uh, let's say, gaming purposes, uh, then there is still background information that can be um, read and accessed um, that is not directly relevant for the task that I'm performing in that particular moment. Uh, but uh, th that's, uh, you know, uh, redundant background information that can be accessed. And, uh, you know, companies might have a commercial interest in mining those data uh, for whatever purposes, for um, psychographic profiling, for training the algorithms and so on. So uh, since there uh, is no conscious control in the filtering of uh, brain data flaws, uh, this creates a problem because our privacy right, you know, privacy is both a right and an ability. And as an ability, uh, it's based on the assumption that people have the ability to filter in and out the flow of information and make conscious decisions about what information they want to seclude to the public and, you know, which information they are fine with, with sharing with the public. Um, mm -hmm. But in order to have this ability to filter in and out the, the flows of information, um, you need to have conscious rational control over mm -hmm. that information. This is something that uh, cybersecurity experts know very well uh, when they say that the best antivirus is the brain. You know, by that they mean that the best way, the best protection you have uh, for securing your data is using your brain and making conscious decisions about um, where, which websites is uh, safe to visit and which ones is, uh, is not uh, safe. But um, this ability of having, you know, a center of conscious rational control of the flow of information uh, does not apply when you are actually processing data about that same center that is supposed to uh, uh, process that information. There is a sort of inception problem uh, there, uh, and this creates an additional problem, I would say. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand that. Are you saying that someone who is having an EEG measuring their brain activity, mm -hmm. that they cannot consciously influence what the readings will be like let, let's say i'm educated in how eegs work i know what sort of mental activity that they measure couldn't i then try to think about a specific object to to you know, to put it simple, the problem, uh, the so-called inception problem is that the best tool you have uh, mm -hmm. in order to protect brain data uh, is the brain itself. Um, yeah. So the, the best tool you have to protect that set of, uh, of data and, and computations is the same processor of data and, and, and uh, computation um, that you want to protect. Uh, this simply creates an additional problem uh, from my personal point of view. Mm. Yeah, but if you want to practical examples of, of uh, how privacy rights might be spelled out in the, in the years to come, um, the most direct applications I would see are not necessarily in the area of mind reading. You know, um, when I talk about mental privacy, um, a lot of people do a sort of a slippery slope argument and they immediately assume that what it's at stake is uh, mind reading. So the possibility of reading the content of thoughts uh, right. from, from human reasoning. Um, and this is, might be an instance of um, you know, scenarios that are protected under the mental privacy right. Uh, but this is a far-fetched uh, scenario. You know? I, I think we're very far from 
uh, reading the content of thoughts, uh, because in order to read the content of thoughts, you need to uh, understand and decode the language of thoughts, uh, the language of the brain. And we don't have, uh, we are very far from uh, having decoded the language of the brain. Mm. Um, so I personally uh, think, you know, this is uh, a logical possibility and with advancing technology with better uh, recording techniques and better AI analytics, we might get there at some point, at the, the, you know, where we can decode um, human thought and their content. Um, but um, I think um, there are privacy sensitive inferences that you can make about the human brain uh, that do not involve uh, decoding human thought at all. Um, so for example, um, you can um, um, access data uh, that um, correlate with the neurological signatures of disease. So you can be, for example, you know, a, a user of a consumer device uh, and uh, um, that the, the data that the device is able to collect um, can be, if adequately mined, can reveal basically biomarkers of, of disease, say right. an increased risk of developing a mild cognitive decline or even Alzheimer's disease dementia in the next two, three years. Hmm. Uh, and if not adequately secured, uh, and if accessed by uh, third parties, for example, health insurance providers um, or employers, that information can lead to significant harm to the data generator. So mm. for example, if uh, say my company knows that I'm going to develop Alzheimer's disease in the next mm. two years, um, they might want to terminate my contract. Um, or my health insurance provider might want to in increase my premiums. Uh, and here we are not reading anything remotely close to human thought, uh, but still that information can be used to make uh, inferences that are quite privacy sensitive. All right. um, and so in th this implication of mental privacy, I think it's more and more important in the big data ecosystem that we live in. Because yeah. there's a lot of research, for example, in digital phenotyping that shows that you can actually uh, make quite reliable inferences um, about you know, people's future uh, probability of developing a certain mental illness uh, by looking even at indirect measures, um, mm -hmm. such as you know, your mobile, um, mobile data, mobile uh, smartphone data. Mm. So this is really an example of uh, basically making privacy sensitive inferences from data that are uh, prima facie uh, known sensitive, right? Um, mm -hmm. And this raises an entire set of uh, uh, challenges when it's applied to the neurocognitive domain, which is uh, uh, extremely uh, private by default. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I like your description of uh of uh, the first two human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please describe the, the human rights of, or rather the suggested human rights of mental integrity? Yeah, I mean, mental integrity uh, is among the four we propose, is the only one that um, um, we haven't phrased ourselves. Okay. Uh, actually, also the other one have some uh, link to the previous um, ethical and legal literature, but the right to mental integrity is actually already recognized in international law. It's in the Article 3 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, for example. Um, and, and there it's uh, strongly associated to the promotion of mental health. Um, so universal access to, to mental health services. Um, and it's basically the um, counterpart of the right to physical integrity. So what we suggest is basically a reconceptualization of this right or a conceptual expansion of this mm -hmm. right to mental integrity as to um, uh, protect also against uh, illicit and harmful uh, uses of newer technology. So um, the um, scenarios that I've described before um, in, in relation to right to mental privacy, uh, they all involve unauthorized access to uh, information, to data and through uh, the processing of this data also to certain sets of information. 
um, the right to mental integrity should be the counterpart uh, that the, the counterpart right that protects not just the access to data, uh, but also protects from the harms that that access can generate, especially if it uh, if the, if it's combined with an alteration of mm -hmm. uh, the functioning either of the underlying neurobiology of the human brain or of the functioning of the device. So to give you a very simple example, uh, if you are imagine um, a patient with Parkinson's disease uh, and you are a user of a deep brain stimulation, which mm -hmm. is an implanted type of the neurotechnology, which has shown um, extremely uh, promising um, effects in uh, reducing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, especially the essential tremor. Um, and then, so you uh, significantly rely on that technology in order to, uh, you know, function normally in your daily life, in order to, uh, to eat, in order to go to the restroom and, uh, independently and so on. Um, if a malevolent hacker uh, intercept the signal of, uh, of your DBS, um, even using a very simple hack, you know, without accessing any information, but simply by increasing or decreasing uh, intensity, uh, that can lead to significant harm. Yeah. To you. Or simply disrupting the functioning of the device, mm -hmm. uh, that can lead to significant harm. Um, and um, this kind of uh, scenarios are not sci-fi. Uh, these are, you know, very simple hacks. A lot of brain computer interfaces rely on uh, wireless channels such as the Wi-Fi on the Bluetooth, Bluetooth channel. And you know, these wireless channels are no, notoriously very easy to intercept. Um, and um, the kind of harm that you can create um, is uh, uh, in a sort of uh, gray zone, in a sort of regulatory no man's land at the moment. Uh, because it's unclear whether it should be regarded as harm to property or if it should be regarded as harm to a person. You know, um, from a uh, prima facie, you could say, well, you know, you're disrupting functioning in a device. So this is, should be considered similar as, you know, just destroying your smartphone, right? Yeah. Um, or destroying, you know, another piece of equipment that you might want to use on a daily basis. Uh, but given the significant function that the, the brain-computer interface has in the daily life of, for example, a Parkinson's disease uh, patient, um, you might argue, and I personally would say so, that this rather qualifies as a harm to the person and to the mental integrity of the person rather than as a harm to the property. Uh, because that technological system is so uh, important in the functioning of the person and so, so much integrated uh, in the uh, motor and cognitive uh, loop uh, of, of that person uh, mm. that should rather be considered as a sort of, you know, peripheral uh, extension mm. of, um, of that person's brain rather than as an independent uh, piece of technological equipment just like any other um, uh, property that uh, a certain person might have. Mm. And what was your suggested solution to this uh, current dilemma? What is the dilemma? So the current legal dilemma between is it property or is it the person? Well, I, that's, a, that's an open question. Um, I'm actually, uh, this is part of, of my current investigation. Um, there is an interesting um, theory it's actually an hypothesis rather than a theory in the philosophy of mind called mm -hmm. the extended mind theory. Uh, and this, this hypothesis says basically um, that if you have uh, an external system, let's say uh, a certain technology, then functions in such a way that if it was in, implanted in a person's head, uh, if it was part of a person's brain, we would have no doubt to consider that as part of a cognitive process of a cognitive mm -hmm. system, um, therefore it should it, it should be considered part of that system. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an argument based on um, it, it was originally developed by two philosophers of mine called David Chalmers and uh, Andy Clark, and 
um, this, this analogy that I just made, they call it the parity principle. Um, so if you have basically an external system that functions, it, it's sort of functionally isomorph to uh, an internal element of a person's cognitive system, say mm. a, a certain brain area that functions in a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, then the mere fact that it's located outside the skull uh, it's no justification for considering uh, it as independent, as unrelated yeah. to the cog cognitive system. Um, and actually, they take it, uh, this argument even farther than simple neurotechnology. They say that even things like a smartphone or a notebook, you know, when you take yeah. uh, notes on, on, uh, with pencil and paper, uh, they can function under certain circumstances as part of your internal cognitive system, as part of... Uh, your memory, for example. Yeah. And I think that um, some instances of this argument uh, can offer a good theoretical uh, substrate for the discussions that we are facing in the field of neuroethics and neural law. Uh, so personally, I would think that if you uh, destroy, uh, either disrupt function or bring computer interface, um, that is, you know, very well integrated in the perceptual, cognitive, or emotional functioning of a person, that type of damage uh, should be rather conceptualized as harm to the person and not as harm to the property. Hmm. Moving on to the fourth and last proposed human rights, psychological mm -hmm. continuity. Right. Um, well, this can basically uh, be interpreted as a subset of mental integrity. And that's a subset of mental integrity that is focused on uh, a personal identity. Mm -hmm. So psychological continuity is also a, a concept that is deeply rooted in, in uh, uh, philosophical discussions. Um, the fam famous philosopher Derek Parfit um, use this language to basically refer to his uh, theory of personal identity. Uh, so the right to psychological continuity should be designed to basically preserve people's uh, personal identity and the continuity of their mental life uh, from unconsented external alteration. Um, so, you know, what makes us the same person throughout life? Um, what is it in your view? Why do you think that you are the same person now than you were two, two years ago or even half an hour ago? Right. So I've practiced a lot of mindfulness and I've read a lot about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And core to that philosophy is the concept of no self. Are you familiar with yeah. that? Yeah. So I don't personally really believe that there is any lasting me um, but i guess the feeling of of me is created in social situations mm. i'd say right so, yeah yeah i mean that, that's exactly the, the reason why i was asking you this question because if you want to have you know a purely reductionist approach and then you say well i am still myself uh because uh, I have the, the, exactly the same neural circuits and exactly the same neurons that I had 10 years ago. Uh, that's a very bad answer because that's to a large extent uh, empirically false. Yeah. You know, neural circuits change. Um, so, uh, you know, basic neurobiology doesn't give us uh, a good argument in favor of considering ourselves as the same persons as before. Um, what we call psychological continuity is way more linked to our uh, personal beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. So we tend to have a certain degree of continuity in the beliefs we hold, which doesn't mean that we don't change our beliefs. It doesn't mean that we don't change our mental states. We do that all the time, but we try to do that in a consistent manner. Um, mm -hmm. And when we do change our beliefs, we tend to be aware of that change and consider that modification in our system of beliefs as part of our identity. Uh, but if, you know, every second, I would have a different belief in relation to literally anything, uh, mm -hmm. then I would hardly consider myself as a subject 
of uh, um, of personal identity of something that can be right. uh, defined uh, personal identity. So um, that's why we think that uh, people should have uh, this right to psychological continuity, uh, which should uh, prevent this unconsented external alterations. Uh, you know, the word unconsented is very important because we change our mental states very often, yeah. uh, even um, as a consequence of very simple chemical stimuli. If I drink coffee, I increase my uh, alert, attention, uh, and concentration spans. Uh, if I drink alcohol, I tend to engage in uh, types of behavior that I wouldn't mm -hmm. uh, engage in if I'm, if I'm sober. Yeah. Um, so, but what is important, so you cannot prevent uh, alterations of psychological continuity uh, per se, but we can prevent unconsented alterations of psychological continuity. Could you uh, so to with the alcohol analogy, uh, it, it's fine if you want to you know, drink alcohol um, but um, it, it's not fine if someone just uh, uh, puts alcohol in your glass uh, without your consent. Yeah. Just tells you, oh, here's water, and then it's actually vodka, and then you drink it uh, because then you haven't chosen, you haven't freely chosen the consequences yeah. of that action. Um, so the same applies to neurotechnology. Uh, if you want to use um, a certain uh, uh, neural device to uh, change, um, um, to alter your cognitive or emotional processes. Um, imagine that, you know, in uh, 20 years from now, uh, we have um, uh, neurotechnologies that can make you significantly more alert or even, you know, more social. Um, and then you want to uh, do that, you know, I, I think you should have the right to do so. Uh, provided that there is no unconsented alteration right. uh, by uh, third parties. Um, so the, the right to psychological continuity, it's both uh, a sub-right of the right to mental integrity and the right to cognitive liberty. Hmm. So psychological continuation is really the right to not have external third parties, third parties that are human or corporations alter your mental state, your psychological state rather? Humans, corporations or algorithms. It doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, another agent, it doesn't have to be another humans, uh, human or group of humans. Um, you know, in, in the so-called closed loop brain computer interfaces, you have embedded AI algorithms mm. that are automatically um, uh, self-calibrate. Um, and there are scenarios where this uh, AIs can actually um, have a substantial impact in the behavioral outputs that you produce mm. as a BCI user. And in those circumstances, it's unclear uh, whether the, the final action is the one that you originally intended, or if your decision making is sort of being hijacked by the automated algorithmic components. Right. Um, this is something very relevant to a class of brain computer interfaces called neuroadaptive uh, brain computer interfaces. Um, and this is also something that would fall under this category, not necessarily, you know, sort of um, uh, criminal, neurocriminal scenarios where. Uh, another actor, another person uh, takes control, but also scenarios where you have AI algorithms uh, that malfunction or that override the uh, signal generated by the human um, agent uh, and so on. All right. I suspect that it may be hard to, to draw the line of what what external factors should be included in this, right? Yeah, but I mean, that's what the, the law is all about, right? It's, it's about defining um, circumstances and requirement mm -hmm. and uh, specifying cases. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, th this is what we provide is a general uh, ethical legal framework uh, 
but it, it's not the end of the story. Mm. Then a lot of work needs to be done yeah. in order to define all those uh, specifications and all these occurrences. Right. Do you think that there are any newer technologies that are commercial, commercially available right now that people use that put people at risk for their brains being hacked? So are you asking if uh, malicious brain hacking is a concrete possibility of today? Yeah. Is it a concrete possibility and is it happening? Uh, well, simple answer is certainly yes. Mm -hmm. um, so any computer device is hackable. So are uh, brain computer interfaces. Um, they, they are uh, based on computer systems. They process digital data. So they are exposed to the same vulnerabilities as any other computer system. Right. Uh, but then, of course, uh, a different question is what kind of um, hacking, what kind of mal malicious hacks are possible mm -hmm. uh, today, given the current level of uh, technological sophistication. Um, and as I said before, uh, what is currently possible is very simple hacks that can still have very negative consequences for the users. For example, disrupting function, uh, intercepting the signal to um, increase or decrease intensity. Mm. Um, or even simply, you know, uh, destroying the device. Mm -hmm. That is something that can have very negative consequences uh, for the user if the user is a neurological patient. Uh, again, going to the example from before, uh, Parkinson's disease patient who uses a deep brain stimulation. There are also experimental studies that show that it's possible to, um, to um, hack um, data generated by uh, a brain computer interface, uh, for example, uh, electroencephalography data. There are studies that uh, manage to, with quite some reliability, to predictively uh, guess uh, the information that was coded in the EEG signal. Um, again, this is not, I need to clarify because you know a lot of people get this wrong. This is not mind reading. Mm -hmm. um, it's not. You know, this kind of hacks are not based on reading the content of thoughts, yeah. but these hacks already are sufficiently sophisticated to access uh, signals, for example, EEG signals, that if adequately analyzed and, uh, and mined, uh, they can be used to make uh, privacy sensitive inferences. Mm. Um, and then of course, the simplest uh, of all hacks is just data leakage. Um, so, you know, that the data that consumer neurotechnologies are generating today uh, is simply going to, you know, be added on top of the already quite extensive uh, digital profiles uh, that uh, commercial entities have from users, mm. uh, you know, together with uh, online search queries, uh, digital health information, uh, smartphone data, wearables data, and so on. So it's, well, you know, it's just another piece of the puzzle uh, that will make the puzzle um, uh, more, um, one step uh, closer to its uh, completion. Right. Um, so, you know, this brain, this brain data that are leaked from uh, consumer neurotechnology applications uh, could contribute to creating more extensive and comprehensive psychographic profiles, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not surprising from my personal point of view that social media giants such as uh, Facebook are so much interested in investing in uh, brain computer interfacing technology. Right. Um, I don't think that they're doing it because they really um, think that there is a significant com com commercial advantage in typing with uh, your brain directly. I, I think the, the real commercial advantage that they see is uh, accessing that additional class of data and merging that data set with the data sets that they already own, which mm. are huge, yeah. uh, and creating very comprehensive psychographic profiles. Right. Is this a risk for someone who may want to improve their cognitive performance and go online and buy a transcranial direct current stimulation device? 
Um, again, in principle, yes. In reality, no. Mm. Uh, because the consumer market is uh, very small at the moment. Uh, so the marginal risk uh, for a, a criminal hacker to, uh, to build the hacking model uh, and, uh, uh, and attack that specific person um, is very low. Mm. Uh, you know, in order to justify the risk that you take in engaging in criminal activities, uh, you need to have a sufficient reward. Right. And now the number of users is so limited uh, that it doesn't make so much sense um, mm. for hackers to create sophisticated hacking models. Mm. Uh, there are so many other technologies that you can um, hack today that are way more widely distributed. And there, you know, the reward uh, would very much justify the risk uh, if you share that basic commitment to um, to criminality. Um, so I, I think, you know, there is a big gap between what is experimentally possible and what is likely to happen in reality, because what is likely to happen in reality does not depend only on what is experimentally possible, but also most importantly on what uh, makes sense um, and what are the, the uh, socio-technical conditions for that to happen. Uh, but you know, if you today you are a user of a consumer um, neuromodulation device, the greater risk that you face is not having your data uh, uh, accessed without your consent. It's not uh, that somebody can hijack the signal. The, the greater risk is that the device simply doesn't work mm -hmm. uh, and that you have spent your money uh, and following certain um, hyperbolic marketing claims that were not based on any evidence whatsoever. Um, and you're basically just uh, wasting your money and wasting your time and wasting your data. Because right. you know, even if the device doesn't work, uh, the company that produces that device is still going to access and process your data. Yeah. What's your understanding of the efficacy of these devices that are commercially available for cognitive enhancement purposes? Well, you know, I've been very vocal, at least I'm perceived as vocally, uh, as a vocal opponent to consumer neurotechnology, but I'm actually not. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually uh, someone who, think, who thinks that it's very important to have uh, consumer, uh, so private company, private sector investment in neurotechnology. And I think that it's very important to have consumer applications of neurotechnology. And I believe that for a very simple reason, uh, because given the global burden of neurological disorders and mental illness worldwide, we really need to expand uh, the quality and quantity of measurements uh, uh, about the human brain mm -hmm. uh, in order to create you know, large scale data repositories yeah. and train algorithms to um, analyze those uh, uh, big volumes of data and make sense of them. Yeah. Um, as Tom Insel once said, uh, you cannot cure what you cannot measure. So mm -hmm. we need to you know, measure brain activity in order to cure uh, brain or mental illness. So I, I think that developments in consumer neurotech can help us get there because yeah. they can help us get more ubiquitous data as we have seen with you know, wearable devices and smartphones and so on. Um, so I, 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 I'm very positive about this. What I'm negative is the misuse of this technology. Mm -hmm. So I really want to make sure that as uh, this consumer neurotechnologies advance, we have created the, the right ethical and legal conditions uh, for uh, this uh, sector of technology development to flourish uh, without causing risks or even harms to, to people. Um, and I think this is a, a very important distinction. Mm. What do you personally do for cognitive enhancement? Well, as I said before, uh, to my knowledge, I'm, uh, I'm very skeptical to, today about you know, using TDCS uh, or something similar to uh, increase my cognitive performance. Uh, things like you know, sleeping well, Mm -hmm. uh, having you know regular sleep patterns, um, um, you know physical exercise. Um, these are all things that have shown uh, scientific evidence uh, of being you know much more useful uh, towards cognitive enhancement than actual direct uh, neuromodulation. Right. 
um, that being said, um, I would be, you know, very, uh, very first in line to use TGCS or TAX or whatever else in 10 years from now, uh, if there are, um, uh, if there is, you know, uh, a clear scientific evidence of their efficacy and safety. Right. And there are some um, studies, you know, in experimental settings, not in the real world, that show some promising potential. So I'm open to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seems to me that almost for any intervention, except for sleep, exercise, and some dietary interventions, mainly just skipping the sugar and not eating way too much or way too little. But except for that, almost all cognitive enhancement interventions need a lot more evidence. Yeah. Yeah. That is something that we're trying to do here at Neutralize, actually, trying to enable people to, in an online application, take psychometric, psychometric tests after using nootropic compounds, so cognitive enhancement okay. compounds. Yeah. See? But just to give you an example, uh, you know, I mentioned that there are certain technologies that are showing uh, some promising potential yeah. in, the, um, in the experimental settings. Um, your readers might be interested in checking out a, a study that appeared in uh, Nature Neuroscience, I think it was last year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was around last spring, uh, which basically used uh, EEG measurements in combination with uh, tax transcranial alternate current stimulation in uh, healthy adults age uh, 60 to 76, so older people, mm -hmm. seniors. Um, and after 25 minutes of stimulation, um, this resulted in rapid improvement in working memory. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, this improvement outlasted the 50 minute post the stimulation period. Um, so I think this is, you know, what probably most people would qualify as cognitive enhancement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really like an, an, an enhancement in working memory performance yeah. in healthy subjects. Right. Uh, you know, there is a lot of debate about whether, you know, enhancement should incorporate or not therapy and, mm. you know, restore, restoring um, normal or baseline function yeah. in impaired people, or if it's just about, you know, uh, over the normal, um, over the baseline uh, improvement. Yeah. Uh, and I think this is something that would also fit in the narrow definition mm. uh, of enhancement. But the, the, the problem, the real challenge that we have ahead of us is mm -hmm. how do we transfer this first promising uh, experiments into um, utilizable consumer applications. Because right. there are you know, huge translational barriers in neuroscience and consumer neurotechnology in particular. So it's gonna really take a lot of time and a lot of hard work to you know, transfer this promising experimental results into real world applications. And there are a lot of bottlenecks that need to be, and a lot of uh, translational barriers that need to be overcome. Yeah. Do you have any idea of how, or, or rather, I should ask, first of all, c could you give a couple of examples of those uh, barriers? Well, yeah, you know, one typical barrier is uh, things work in the lab. They don't work uh, anymore when they are tested in the real world. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of problems for this, usually because the uh, the design, uh, the, the study design in the lab was not um, adequately sketched. Um, there were some methodological limitations or the devices were not adequately tested with their end user groups um, or the sample size of the study was too small. Mm. Uh, that also happens very, very often. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, there is also a more general problem, um, namely that there is, um, it's much cooler to develop a, a new product and obtain funding for developing a new product than for implementing um, existing uh, prototypes. Mm. Um, you know, implementation is not perceived by investors as as cool as uh, design and development. Mm. So you know, there is always a lot of money that flows into design and development. But then a lot of startups face a lot of financial limitation when it comes to implementing mm. um, what they've done. 
Um, and that, that, that's a totally dysfunctional um, mm. system. This is also where you could intervene uh, and try to remove these translational barriers. Mm. Thank you, Marcello, for coming on the Neutralize podcast. Ah, thank you. It was a pleasant conversation.